Hey guys, it's Evan Borch here coming back here and trying to do a follow-up on Lighting 101. We'll call this one Lighting 102 um, and want to sort of answer some of the questions, talk about a few quick examples and sort of actually give you guys a few things that you can try out using lights that you have. Um, and basically, you know, I think that one of the things that I'm really trying to teach you guys how to do is how to reverse engineer things because that's really important to be able to see a look and, and recognize what it is and then be able to build it yourself because that's a lot of what we do. Um, but then another big part of it is learning how to use whatever's around to get what you need. Um, because when you sort of just uh, get used to a setup of like, oh, I put a Kino here, oh, I do this there, and you don't really understand what you're doing, it's hard to replicate that. So I want to teach you how to be able to do the same thing, whether you have big fancy movie lights or you have practicals or you have whatever you may have around. Um, so first I want to go over questions. So um, how often do you shut off interior lights and replace with your own? Um, I'm not sure. This could mean one of two things. This could either mean like um, when there are overhead fluorescents or tungsten lights in somewhere, um, replacing them with either movie lights or new practicals. Like some people swap out bulbs. I would say that I do that sometimes. I don't swap out like practical bulbs that often. So like if you have a lamp on the desk, say like this desk lamp, which I moved over, but there's a desk lamp over here on the other side of the mic stand has a tungsten bulb in it. Um, some people will get daylight bulbs and swap those out to like match color temperature and stuff. I don't usually do that, but it is an option. Um, I do sometimes turn off indoor stuff. I often turn off indoor stuff actually. Um, and I'm going to admit now that I sort of figure this out as I go. So I have to sometimes dig up reference frames as I go. Um, but let's say um, something like like these are good examples of frames where we sort of turned off all the practicals in the room and um, let daylight come in and then we just added some light to help pick them out. Um, so that is something we do and is part of lighting, but then a lot of times we just let the practicals play and that's sort of where it comes back to that recognizing what you're trying to do and when it's helping what you're trying to do and when it's hurting what you're trying to do, which I'll get into more. Ben wants to know, do you ever worry about controlling ambient with anything other than camera settings, um, cutting down or blocking window light with ND films or grid cloth, etc.? seem to be hitting the limits of my LEDs, but mostly because I'm fighting full sun coming through the windows. So this gets us onto a great point, which is um, sort of a multi multifaceted point that I don't have my tablet plugged in right now, so I'm gonna try and draw a little for you guys with my mouse, um, and it's probably gonna be pretty bad, um, but actually I can think of a good way to um, sort of make a example of this. Um, oh wait, where'd that Paul frame go? That's an okay example. Okay, um, open this. So let's take this very quickly as an example of exposure. Because one thing I want to talk about is um, exposure because it's a sort of an imp important thing that plays into lighting. So <clears throat> let's look at this frame of Paul. Um, it's from a, just a talking head thing that I did a while ago. Um, <clears throat> and basically if you imagine you were to sort of like paint by numbers and you were to say, let's make a new layer. We were to say that, okay, you know, um, the, this area, well, let's go the other way. Cause that's easier to see. This area is like a hundred brightness units, this whole bright area. Um, we have <clears throat> a certain amount of light right here that equates to pretty close to full white. It's not cause it's not clipping, but it'll make sense in a minute when I finish explaining this. So we'll call the bright stuff 100. And then we'll go over here and we'll call this stuff. This is all zero. You can't even see that I'm drawing black on it. Uh, so we'll replace black with red over here. But this stuff is all zero. You know, all of here, there's no information. It's just black. Um, and then over here is zero, sort of in this area over in here. And so this area is all zero, and that's how this camera's reading it, the sensor's reading it, there's nothing really going on there. Now, let's say we were to take, um, you know, if you look at maybe this scale of a, of a sort of a color, uh, not a color wheel, I don't know what you call it, it's like a color picker, and you consider that um, the top is white, the bottom is black, and consider this is your 100, this is white, this is zero, which is black, and that's sort of just a, a gradient number. 
Um, and let's say that like we go up to here, maybe this is like 75 and this is what like this area of Paul's face is right here. And I'm sort of just highlighting where some of these like 75 areas are. And then we come down and we say, okay, this is like 50, you know, and this isn't quite exact, but just so you get the idea, this is where these various light levels are falling. And this just looks like a crazy face painted guy. But what I want to point out is that that's all relative to our exposure. <clears throat> so let's say now if we were to take Paul and we were to open our camera up a stop, then this stuff, which realistically the white here, let's say is 75 because it's not clipping. We open our camera up a stop and everything goes a little bit to the left. So the zeros come up to 25, everything else comes up and that changes our exposure. Um, and everything else plays relatively to that. So <clears throat> sort of how that can play out is, let's say you're trying to, to light something. You have to understand how much light your sensor needs, and then you have to understand how much light other things are putting off. So let's say that like right now, I have an aperture LS1 half over here, um, which is on a remote. I have a RET1 tungsten up here bouncing into the ceiling and coming back in with some tungsten fill dimmed down. And then I have ambient from my computer. So currently, let's say, you know, however many sensors this, or how many stops this RX100 reads, um, based on your exposure, it can read a certain number above the middle, a certain number below the middle, and everything past that doesn't matter. So we're trying to sort of keep it in the range. If you look over here, this is obviously out of the range. And then, you know, if you were to find something truly black with no light on it, it would be out of the range again. So let's say for some reason we wanted to be able to see that and not have it be clipped, but we wanted me to look the same. We have to bring up all the light on me without that getting any brighter. And then the rest of our exposure will change, <clears throat> but that will stay the same. In the same way, you know, we could say, okay, we want to bring um, Paul up and we want to leave the background. And then it's like, okay, we lift the, the, um, we lift Paul's levels without affecting the background much, but we're going to have to stop down more um, in order to maintain the level we were getting on him. Um, so let's say, let's find another quick example frame because this one's not necessarily making this super clear, I feel like. Um, <clears throat> so I'm actually going to, instead of doing this right now, I'm going to show you guys on this little camera that we do have here. Um, so we have the aperture aperture is currently functioning as T as the key because it's the brightest thing falling on me right now. So key side is right over here. Fill side is right over here. If I were to take the, uh, fill and knock it all the way down, we now <clears throat> change the lighting on me where relative to the exposure, I'm staying the same, but the background and this whole side of the frame is changing. So I have to know where that light's falling and what's going to be affected as I change the level. Now, if we punch the T1 all the way up, it actually comes up above and the daylight almost goes away where you can't really feel it. And the camera's bringing exposure down automatically, which makes this a little bit of a harder demo. But as the camera brings me down into the level where I was, say that, you know, if we kill this, I'm at like a 70 on this side of my face, brightness on the sensor, and this side of me is like a 25. Now, as I kick this up, and it has like 125 light units coming out of here and hitting me, that uh, 75 that we had here gets bumped down because the camera has to bring everything down by 50 to keep things in that range. And so this comes down to a 25, and this comes up to a 75 because the camera has to knock down 50. Hopefully this is sort of making sense. And so that's why that sits back down into the mix. Now, say we were to do this the opposite way. We kill the aperture all of a sudden, and now this becomes the key because there's not much light coming from this side. Now, the thing to note here is that, as I mentioned before, there's a little bit in 101, there's some fill here that's coming naturally just from light bouncing around the room and whatever else, because there are no other light sources. But if this were like a black room, you would see no wrap over here. Now, if we were to kill, this guy, which currently, let's say that that's giving off a couple hundred light units. My computer's giving off light, but you can't really tell because it's so far below everything else that it's not really playing. But if we kill this, all of a sudden the computer light becomes apparent because the exposure gets raised up and now you can see me relative to the computer light. So let's take that and the camera's fighting me now on autofocus. We turn that guy back on, camera re-exposes, and this is where the light's at now. Bring this guy back up for a little bit of fill and we're back sort of to where we started. So your exposure levels for different things 
are always relative to everything else. And so when you're shooting in a room that, say, has a lot of windows in it, um, you have to be able to punch relative to the windows. So let's say that, like, let's take this example frame and pull it in here. We walked into this classroom, um, which was a college classroom pretending to be a high school classroom, and it's going to bother me that that doesn't fit. Um, and we had to light the room. And so I get to quickly look at a room, and they say, okay, how are you going to light it? Because our gaffer had to you know, come in with his crew and do it while we were shooting the scene before. And so what I'm looking at is I'm saying, okay, well, there's a bunch of light outside the window over here. Um, and we have no control over this. I asked if we could get lights outside the windows and they said no, cause we we're on a second floor. Um, so this whole thing that I'm highlighting right now is uncontrollable as far as I'm concerned, because there's nothing I can do to change what that looks like outside. So let's say that like the natural light coming in is really cool. Um, I dig the way it looks, but there's going to be two problems. Um, much like the tungsten in the background, the amount of light that we're losing by the time it hits me means that fixture itself is clipped. And so the amount of light that we're losing coming through this window by the time it hits them, if we expose for them, outside is going to be way clipped. Because outside here right now, like this wall is our main light source. You know, there's another building out there and the sunlight is hitting it, bouncing back through the window and um, lighting these guys. So since our light source is this wall and the light source is in the frame, it's going to clip. So what we can do is sort of like we would do, say we took the aperture and we brightened it way up. I don't know if the camera's going to re-expose for this. Okay, there we go. See, the, the T1 exposure comes down relative because the camera is bringing everything around. It's cram uh, compressing everything down into that range where now the light on my face is close in value to the light over there. Now, say that we were to bring the... Uh, LS one half way down for me to stay at a decent level camera has to boost the amount of light coming into it which means this guy starts to clip so what we do is we have to punch a similar amount of light to what's coming in through the windows so this all normally gets measured in stops by the way I'm sort of trying to keep it more uh, layman's terms just for the sake of hopefully helping these things click and then when we talk about stops that's an easy conversion to make so let's say that out here we have, um, we'll do it in blue just for the sake of making it easy. We have like this really bright blue is the amount of light that's coming in from out here. And so there's nothing we can do about that. So we come in and we go, okay, there's however much this is, um, light coming in. If we want them to be exposed well relative to that, I'm okay with the window being a little brighter than them, but we need to punch them up pretty close to that. So. If we just exposed for them, windows would clip. If we exposed for the windows, they would be silhouettes. But now if we do what we did, which is put a big um, ultra bounce over in the corner of the room and shoot a joker into it, that pushes a bunch of extra light and brings them up. Um, and then we're able to bring the exposure down. We stop down, put ND in, whatever we want to do, and everything comes into that nice range together. And so now the windows aren't clipped, they're not too dark, they're not too bright, and it all feels natural. And so we're managing those levels to sort of get things to where we're controlling it, the brightness of how things are falling. Another quick point to make here is that we used a eight by eight ultra bounce because it creates a big soft source far away, which makes it so that these guys um, are at uh, a soft light and that it uh, is falling evenly. Whereas like we could put say a quasar right next to them, like right here, uh, horrible color, put a quasar like right over here and it might give us the same output, but um, due to the inverse square law, which now I'm getting more complicated again, look up the inverse square law, but basically, Yes, you can get the same amount of output that close with a smaller light, but it's going to fall off faster. So if these guys were exposed okay from the quasar, um, because it's closer and providing the same amount of light that's hitting them, the people behind them would be super dark and the people in front of them would be super bright if light was in front of them. So as we back the light up, the spread over, say, that 10 feet gets more consistent um, and the, we just need a brighter source at the beginning. This is continuing to be less simple, I feel like, than I think it is. But so hopefully you guys will have questions. I can clarify again in 103. So creating a soft, big source. That's what the ultra bounce is for. The joker is our bright light that allows us to punch at the level of the window so that everything looks okay. And then the other thing I'm managing is what we can sort of see if we look here is um, 
you can uh, pretty clearly see where exactly the Joker is falling. So let's kill this guy. So this area, now let's do something a little higher contrast. This area is pretty much where the light from the Joker and the Ultra Bounce is falling. Um, boop a doop a doo, boop a doop a doo. So if you look at this with and without, can you sort of see there's like these highlights and that's where our Ultra Bounce and Joker are falling. It's also making this nice catch light in his eye right here, um, creating that little reflection, which is good. So then the next thing that we had to do in this situation is figure out what we wanted the other side of their faces to look like. Say they're in a black room again, the Ultra Bounce is falling in the blue highlighted area. But if there's no return, this part of their faces is just clipping black, which we don't want. Now, we were in a white-walled room, and so actually between the windows and the Joker, it was still feeling pretty flat, where the amount of light bouncing back from the wall over frame left was just filling this in, and we weren't getting this nice little edge. And by edge, I mean the edge of the light, which is this. Sort of just outlining the contour of that edge, if you look at it, between brighter and darker. So I wanted that edge, and since the uh, fill side light was punching similar output to the to the key side light, it just looked like the same amount of brightness. You know, there's no brighter, darker side. So to make this side a little darker, we took um, some black negatives, which are just black pieces of fabric, anything you can use that doesn't reflect light or blocks light, and we moved those over onto that side of them so that that light wouldn't get bounced back and that level would come down a little bit. And by bringing that level down a little bit, we created the shape we needed on here. Um, and that was pretty much it. I think the only other thing is there was a little bit of a joker push off the back wall, which is sort of just creating these super subtle extensions of the um, window highlight here that you can barely even see. But there's just a little edge from that super push down joker in the back. Um, so the other thing I would briefly mention here is motivation. And so motivation is basically the idea that for a light to look natural, it has to look like it's coming from somewhere. And it shouldn't look like it's coming from somewhere that doesn't make any sense. Now, the thing I would say is that when I started out, I thought motivation meant like, look at a place and see where the light is coming from and just make more of it. Excuse me. But now I think that what motivation means is knowing in your head the way that light tends to fall and the sort of cues that we take when we look at something and being able to go like, well, at this place, maybe this wouldn't happen because the sun can't be there, but we don't know that because we can't see outside, so let's play it in a way that could make sense in reality. And so basically what we're doing is we're saying, okay, we have these windows here. They're going to naturally be pushing some soft light onto these guys, and we're wrapping the joker a little more around the front, which is technically unnatural because the regular fall is going to be right here, but pushing it around the front gives it that nice quality of where the wrap is, where we are getting this sort of 45-degree angle. Um, and it feels natural because we see the windows and we go, oh, there's light coming from over there. If we were to key them from this side, like from frame left where the fill side is right now, we would usually be tend to be confused. We're like, I see windows, but that's the dark side of them. It's not that often in real life that you see windows and the near side of you is dark. You know, it's that little psychological cue that it's like usually the side of me that's closer to a window is the bright side of me. So um, that's another thing that I'm sure we'll get into more throughout these various videos. Um, I did want to see if I could quickly pull another reference for, let's see, uh, of course it's like name, date modified, sometimes I have a really hard time finding the, uh, the shots that I'm looking for. Okay, so let's go back to this one. Not this one, this one. Um, and this is sort of another quick example of, we can tell that there's windows on the right side of him and there's a wall on the left side of him. So the main light should not be coming from the left side of him because usually light doesn't come out of walls. So if we're going for this sort of natural daylight look, naturally the daylight would be coming from the right side of him. Naturally it is, but it's not coming in at this level, it's not coming in this soft, but we don't know that because we can't see the sun and everything else. So we go, eh, makes sense. Maybe there's another building there. Maybe there's something else that there's a soft, bright source. But it feels like based on what we can see, this makes sense. So that's sort of where our motivation is coming from. 
And this is also another example of where um, we're taking motivation and where we can see where a light would naturally be coming from. We're pushing it in in a way that feels um, natural-ish, where like if we lit him up another three stops and exposed down on the outside was super dark, it would look super lit because we're like, natural light hitting this guy is never that much brighter than outdoors. So you sort of have to just get a sense for like looking at how things naturally feel and then play around with them. Whew. Um, let's see. Let's go back to the questions because I think we have some more. Sort of was talking about, oh, so what I guess the long story short of what Ben's question is, there are times that we control ambient light with something other than camera settings. Um, ND films and, and nets and whatever else. Um, there are definitely times that, you know, I've put diffusion outside a window to knock down the amount of light coming in through it, or uh, we've put a net outside, you know, some direct sunlight just to bring the, the level down a little bit into where we're playing. Um, but overall, a lot of the time, um, it's honestly easier to punch up the light that we're adding than it is to cut down the light that exists. I think that <clears throat> when you're starting out, you don't really understand always that like it's not quite clicking how to make it look really natural and so it's easier to try and just like control natural light because fake light looks fake when you do it um but once you can make fake light look real it's like it's easier for me to just let the sun do what the sun's doing and i'll punch myself up into that range than it is for me to try and bring the sun down into the range that you know the natural light that i'm having is at so yeah leds can be somewhat limiting with that um you just just need an m18 no but um but you you know you can be smart about that and that's where even those interviews you know um we were smart about being able to walk the leds in as close as we could for these things um and and playing so that we could still expose outside we theoretically could have nd'd the windows and lit him not as bright and gotten a similar result but at the end of the day, it's easier for me to just punch more light, you know? Um, so hopefully that answers that. Um, custom white balancing and then changing for taste, eye balancing and dialing, and Kevin, Kelvin as far as white balance. It's usually totally um, pulled, out of, pulled out of our butts based on the way we want it to look. Um, you know, because sometimes, sometimes you like, you're going for something really specific and it has to match. So like you're shooting all daylight fixtures and you're going to shoot camera at 56 because every white has to look white. But the rest of the time, it's usually just like getting a sense of those uncontrollable things. Um, so like, <clears throat> let's jump back to the tell interview. Um, the thing about these is that like we had no control over the white balance or exposure brightness of the light that's outside. So we're playing everything off of that. So if I want outside to look right, I'm going to white balance to the uncontrollable thing and I'm going to expose for the uncontrollable thing. So if I want the, the background to play a tiny bit warm and a tiny bit exposed over the subject, I'm going to push the camera a little. So let's say we push, if the daylight is like 5,600 Kelvin, we can push camera to like 5,200 Kelvin, which we're moving the camera warmer then the light source and then we're going to expose to that and then we're going to push the other light that we're adding relative to that so we pretty much wanted it to match so we left the quasars pretty much right around uh 5600 as well i believe so that they would play a tiny bit warm maybe maybe we pushed them to 52 i honestly don't remember exactly excuse me and then we're punching enough light um on him because that's the thing we can control is the light on him to get him up into that level to play in that space of the exposure that we're creating <sighs> da, 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 da. Um, but yeah, and then it's totally to, get to taste. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that we just shoot all at like 4,300, um, and then let daylight fall cool and tungsten fall warm. Um, some stuff gets pushed various different ways. Like this stuff is probably 4,300 Kelvin. You can see there's some stuff outside that are, it's playing cool and the tungstens are playing warm. Um, so it really depends on the look of the project. This stuff is more accurately white balanced, but it does have a little tungsten push in it sometimes. Um, this thing, if you watch the breakdown for it, I don't know, that's not the right one. We lit it all at 5,600 white balance at 5,600 as far as I'm aware. But then sometimes you look at it and it just looks not quite the way you want it to. And you just push it around, you know, see how it works. Something like this, we wanted it to read really warm. And so we pushed, uh, 
so that everything else in the room that was in here would sort of read the colors how we wanted. So we pushed most of that warm. Then there's a little rim light over here that's pushing this blue light in. And so we, we sort of had to set the camera so that the practicals appeared the color temperature we wanted. So they would read a little warm. And then we wanted that light to be cool and to add a color contrast. So we had to push that light relative to our new camera white balance. So it had to be cooler than what the camera was set to, if that makes sense. And then we pushed my key warmer too, because it sort of just seemed to fit into the the mood of everything. So it's usually sort of picking various things on the on the white balance wheel and um, fitting them into there. Um, oh wait, this is another good example of something that you know was pretty much accurately white balanced. Um, and I did a breakdown of lighting this food thing. You can go find it if you, you dig back for it, but we wanted all the colors to be accurate. So we're not going to push this warm or cool. We're going to light it all at 5,600. There's a little bit of daylight. So we're going to try to keep all our lighting units at daylight. Um, and then we're going to white balance the camera to daylight. Now there could be times in there that we do a little push. Like maybe we just add a tiny bit, like a quarter CTO to something to just add a little contrast. But for the most part, like if it has to be accurate, it's accurate. And then if it's not, we're sort of pushing it based on mood and feel to go warmer, or cooler, or whatever else would make sense. Um, so that's it. That's it for questions on this one. Um, so I sort of want to want to run through a few more things just to try and help make this all make sense. Um, so I'm actually I was going to go to Vimeo, but first I'm going to go. Uh, where are they all? I have a reference folder and I appear to have lost it. It's probably in my Dropbox now. Um, so what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to go through some references for a project that I've got coming up, which will be fun to talk about. Um, okay. Visuals. <clears throat> Lighting. Uh, okay. These are cool. So, one other thing that I wanted to briefly touch about is we talked in 101 about how uh, softness is determined by the apparent size of the source. And one interesting trick with that <clears throat> is that it doesn't always play exactly the way you think it will. So let's say um, <clears throat> you have a window and um, let's say your window is the size of an SD card. And on the other side of your window, you have like a 40 by <clears throat> diffuse giant light source for some reason, like you're outdoors. You have a big outdoor soft source. <clears throat> um, and so it's huge. It's like 80 by 80. And then you have a person inside that window, um, inside the house, and they're standing like 10 feet from the window. Based on what they can see through the window, they can only see about a window sized chunk of what's outside. And so the light that's hitting them when they're standing 10 feet away will be as soft as that window sized light. As they move closer, if you think of yourself walking towards the window, you start to be able to see more and more of the outside, and that's your apparent light source, and the light's going to continue to get softer and softer. And so you can use flags and things to make it so that light isn't going everywhere. If you imagine you're making a little window, but if it's close to someone, it's still going to be super crazy soft. And then the opposite way, you can use that to take a naturally big light source and sort of box it off a little bit further away. And if the person can only see or the object can only see a little bit of it, it becomes a harder source. So this is getting long, so I'm going to try and sort of speed it up a little. So let's look at this real quick. Um, here you have something that, in my opinion, is not um, like a super soft source on either side. It sort of has a soft feel to it, but it's really, it's really not. Because if you look at this edge, um, like the edge right on the side of his nose here, it's not super soft. Like there's a pretty quick edge to it. Um, and so there's a relatively hard light on frame right that's sort of falling on him, almost sort of like how this LS1 half is falling on me right now. Let's take that and say that that's our example, kill this guy. And we have sort of, sort of one of these deals going on, sort of similar to him, right? But what he has is um, he has this other hard source coming in behind him and it's coming from behind him at like a 45 degree angle and creating this light on him. And you can tell where it's coming from because it stops here, you know? And so it's like, if the light isn't hitting here, then the light's not in front of him. It has to be behind him. Um, and then they're leaving this gap of darkness is sort of in the middle there. Now, if you wanted to make this feel a little more like a fashion commercial or something, you push a little extra light probably on a softer source into that, um, this dark area. So you put sort of from um, frame left closer to the camera, put a beadboard or something 
Oh, I think that the, the little camera just stopped because I hit 30 minutes. So we'll see if this might work. Might have cut out for a second. But um, push a little more in there. You'll bring up the darkness, but you won't really affect everything else because everything else is still going to be way brighter and it's not going to have quite the drama that this does. But then when you pull it out, you get that drama. So you sort of have that control of of how you want things to fall. Now this is a great example of where, <clears throat> because the sun is so far away, sunset um, is a very hard source. And so you're getting this direct sunlight. So it's not bounced, it's not um, diffused, it's not coming through a cloud. It's just direct sunlight from super, super far away, which makes it a super small apparent source. And because it's such a hard edge, because it's such a small source, you can see the hard edges on everything. So if you want to take this and like replicate this look, you can take something, um, that's a small source, a hard source. And especially if you put it a little further away from wherever you're throwing the light, so it appears hard. Um, and then you throw up something like these windows, you know, sort of the, the cross hatching in them is getting in the way of the light. Those hard edges are gonna start appearing. So if you put a really soft light on the other side of this, it's not gonna make those edges and beams because you need that hard edge from a hard source, which is a small source, like a flashlight or something. You can test this. I actually did this while I was watching a movie the other night. If you order anything from Amazon, have a spare sheet of cardboard around take that piece of cardboard and cut some shapes into it, sort of like these windows, and then um, try a few different sizes. I'd recommend maybe about like this big if you're making a four hole window, you know, from the square, 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 square. Um, and take a few small lights, like a flashlight, and punch it through and play with how far you move the flashlight from the thing and see um, the shapes that you get and sort of how it, it cuts through. And then take a softer source and push it through and see how that plays. Um, and you can also sort of <clears throat> play with dimming your um, your source that's coming through this this gobo or, or cookie, which is what we call something that uh, breaks up light like that. And you can sort of sit it in because if you just punch like a ton of daylight in here right now and there's no other light, you can see all the outside sort of clips. But maybe we want this sort of hard feel, but we still want to see the rest of the room well, maybe we create a perceived soft source also skipping around. Because like, say that say that where the camera is right now, right behind the camera, there were a white wall. Um, that direct sunlight bouncing onto the floor up into the wall would bounce back into the room and would fill everything out, you know? So it would feel natural if we pushed some lower level soft light there. And this is sort of another example of that where we have some hard bright light coming through here, but it's not too bright, you know, it's not clipping but it's higher in our exposure. We have some um, relatively, I would say, sort of hard light hitting this side of the guy's face, um, and that's what's creating all this brighter area. But then we have a really good low-level soft fill, and so the shadow side of him is getting just that little like 10% in your exposure. It's low in your waveform, but you're just pushing a tiny bit of soft light back in, and that's what gives this this feel. Whereas if you just had the light from the right side and no return, you know, there's no fill, it's just gonna feel sort of weird and really dramatic. Um, and if you like just super punch a lot of light back in or push like a hard fill back in, it's gonna feel very different. But this low level soft fill is what gives it this very sort of cinematic sensibility to it. Sort of what's happening here. We have a hard key on this side of Marcus's face and then we have just a tiny bit of soft fill coming in on the other side so that you can still see what's going on in here. You know, you see his face, he's not sitting out of the image, but he's also not like super filled in. He's just sitting lower into things. Here we have another uh, soft thing and then we're letting this side fall off now so we don't really have as much of that low level fill. Um, and so we just have a soft source frame right there's a little bit of a hard source throwing these hard edges from through the window behind him, but not hitting him exactly. And that's all that's going on in this frame. There's no fill, there's no light from frame left at all, really. And when that, and when I say that again, that's relative to the exposure. Like there could be a lamp 10 feet to his left, but if all the window coming, all the light coming from frame right is like really bright because it's a bright fixture, then when you expose for that, the window, the lamp on his, his right frame left isn't gonna play at all. Another example of all light has to come from somewhere. You know, if you look at this, it's like, okay, there's a hard source that's coming through something and just making this slash of light, another little slash of light here. So you can make this, take a hard source and uh, take that piece of cardboard and cut a shape short of, sort of like this. And you can make a hard slice that um, will fall just like this on someone. 
and it's sort of above him and coming down a little bit if you look. But the other thing is that there is a soft source somewhere else frame right from him because if you look here like there's a real shadow side in here of like this stuff's basically clipping to black but then over here we have sort of a soft uh, just a soft light coming out from him and if you were to um, take the hard light out of the equation and just turn that off and look at him it's really just a very simple soft wash from frame right um, really low in the exposure just barely picking him up and then there's a hard thing sitting on top of that. So this mixture of hard and soft light is often the key to that cinematic lighting um, and just looking at things and seeing how they're falling. So maybe it's a wall next to him. You know, we don't really think about where that soft light's coming from, but something is doing it. Um, yeah, and, and so another test just sort of on the soft light, hard light thing, even if you have an iPhone flashlight or something, preferably a small um, light source, turn it on and uh, shine it at your friend or something or yourself, you know, um, look at the way the light falls, shine it at your hand, and you'll get this really sharp fall off. Um, and as you bring it in, you'll notice that the shadows get a little softer. And as you pull it away, you'll notice that the shadows get harder. And then if you take it and you point it at the wall or the ceiling or something, you'll see that everything gets softer, all your shadows get lifted up, everything gets a little darker, but it's all getting at a similar level because you're making that bigger source. And so you can do that with a flashlight, you can do that with a hard light, like the, the R, you know, if we throw it up into the ceiling, it's super soft in general, but if I were to like put my hand right in front of it here, um, that will be a hard light. So I'm gonna try to quickly, uh, let me see if I can drop box myself something real quick. Oh, where's my phone? One second, guys. I could just try to import this after, but I'll probably forget. You guys are getting some on-the-fly learning here, and I think this is what we're going to end 102 with. Um, but so I was on a shoot the other day, and I just saw a great visual representation of this sort of um, soft and hard light idea and some of the stuff that we were talking about before. And it was in the form of a uh, Leco being shot through some diffusion. So what's basically going on here is a Leco is a tungsten, a tungsten light. Um, this might've been a Joe leak. Yeah, this was a Joe Leco actually, which is sort of the industry term for a Joker back like light bulb in a Leco body. Um, so this is daylight, but it makes a really hard light. So it's great for creating those slices and stuff. Um, cause you can cut it really well. It's a very hard source, but when you take it and you let the beam spread a little bit and then hit it with the sheet of diffusion, it softens way up because now you have, instead of this like tiny one inch light source back in there, you have this, uh, I don't know what it is, like a three foot light source. And so I was standing here and I was like, oh look, you can see the hard light and the soft light just based on which side of this diffusion you're on. And so you can exactly see the, the beam fall off too. But so if you look, I put my hand in front of it and you can see there's some pretty soft edges to all of these shadows. It's not like super, super, super soft where it's just wrapping everything in, but it's creating this nice contour from having this like three foot by three foot source. Now, when I take my hand and I move it to the other side of diffusion where my hand can only see the small light source, it's a much sharper edge on everything. And obviously it's punching a lot more light, which means that the relative exposure on everything else changes. And then the minute you go back to the other side again, my hand sees this circle that you're seeing as the light source now, and that becomes the soft source. So this was a long video. I'm gonna stop now. Hit me with some more questions, guys. Really, I want you to get this, and I feel like it's it's something I just have to reword and kind of re-explain, <laughs> and I'm workshopping a little as we go. It's easier to explain with visual references, and I got some stuff so that we're gonna try and do a shoot soon where I can sort of uh, showcase actual lighting setups live in front of you. Um, but I want to sort of like build the vocabulary and the premise first so that then when we get into the setups, I don't have to be like, oh, well, here's why this is harder than why this is soft, you know? So thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you for your support. Let me know if you dig this. Let me know what you want to see next time. Tell your friends about it. And that's about it. Love you guys. Bye.